excited about everybody coming out tonight. Welcome to the first ever Investor Fest, New Orleans 2023. Everybody put your hands together, please, for the first ever 2023 Investor Fest. I am Emil Hurst Jr., buy and hold investor. We also run lease management company that is a third party lease management company for investors just like you. And also, I'm a member of the West Bank Real Estate Investor Meetup, and we meet every second Thursday of the month, 610 6th Street on the West Bank, 6 p.m. Uh, to 8 p.m. each month. Dominique? And my name is Dominique Gunderson. Uh, I am mainly a fix and flip investor here uh, on the West Bank area. We usually run about 10 to 12 flips at a time. Um, if just want to kind of say if Emil and I can ever be of any help or, or um, just guidance or anything, we'd love to meet with you guys tonight and just so come say hi and, and we're, we're just super excited to have everybody. So um, quick announcement. The reason we put this event on and what we're so excited about is to bring a room full of people like this together because this is where deals happen, partnerships form, um, and your business just grows and gets a thousand times better with the connections that can be made in this room. So we're really excited to see um, people packing in and, and it getting busy here. But uh, one thing that uh, you might have noticed is we were promoting this event as InvestFest. Uh, so I actually got a, a funny email the other day. Uh, from a lawyer that was uh, told me that the name InvestFest is actually trademarked and that we have to take it down. So you might have noticed, but we are actually Investor Fest, New Orleans. So <laughs> that's uh, that's our name, and uh, that's how much traction we've gotten from from promoting it. So. <laughs> um, got it. Yep. Uh, we got that cease and desist letter. So before. <laughs> We had to come out of pocket, we had to add the, uh, the OR. But, so our commitment uh, to everybody in the room is to keep this event free. But the only way that we are able to keep this event free is for everybody that's in this room over here. So everybody, please give a round of applause for our sponsors. That's the real money investors out there. Those are the people that made it all possible uh, for free. So those are amazing companies. But most of all, these are companies that we already do business with on a day-to-day. -day. So we didn't fly in anybody uh, national that you would never have uh, a direct connection with. Uh, so that is another reason why these people are here. We vouch for them. Uh, and we just love doing good business with good business people. All right? So I'll just give a quick an announcement of who's over there um, and who to go check out and shake some hands with. Um, we have David Birdsong of Gulf South Title. Um, he's an investor himself, and he is actually um, he's actually the former president and current board member of the New Orleans Real Estate Investors Association. So being an investor himself, he loves to make sure that the title work goes really smoothly for even complex transaction. He's handled successions, um, creative financing deals, estates, wills, all kinds of stuff. So David uh, is the one to go to for any investor friendly title company they might be looking for. Uh, we also have Katie Tassin, who's in the back over there. Um, she is a ex very experienced investor-friendly realtor. So she works both on the buyer and seller side. Um, and she's very, very up to speed with all kinds of the first-time home buyer lending programs and things that exist. So if you're a buyer and know a buyer looking, she can help you with that. Um, or on the seller side, just knowing exactly what um, types of roadblocks or stumbles that might come up dealing with some of these first-time buyers. So kind of getting things prevented ahead of time. So definitely talk to Katie if you're looking for an agent. Um, we also have Candace Farthing from Movement Mortgage. Candace has been in the mortgage business for over 20 years now, and she specializes in all kinds of residential loans, but she actually has a couple investor-friendly products that would be great to chat with her about. Um, a DSCR loan for getting uh, approved for a property based on the rental income it produces versus you as the actual borrower, um, as well as a renovation loan with 15% down if you're looking to do renovations to something. All right. Then we have Stephen Leonard of Pelican Property Management. Raise your hand, Stephen. All right. Pelican Realty Louisiana is a family-owned and operated business. 
owner, Stephen Leonard, and his son, Nick Leonard, Nick Regan, he is the yellow shirt, works with investors throughout New Orleans area and beyond to help buy, sell, and manage investment properties. Their goal is to maximize returns on your properties with a combined 35 plus years in real estate and investing industry. They use proven methods <clears throat> to make the most of any property from rentals to vacant land. Offering free owner consultations, be sure to give them a call to get started creating and implementing a plan to capitalize and get the most out of your investments. And I just want to add to that, if you want a no-nonsense property manager that's going to call you with solutions instead of problems, that's definitely one of the people uh, that you want to have on your team as you scale up. Also, we have Anitra and Elridge with Vertical Capital, back there in the back. Vertical Capital offers creative solutions to real estate investors who are looking for funding on their next deal. Their primary product is the short-term bridge loan, which is a flexible option that allows investors to, make, uh, to take on new acquisitions, refinance existing investment properties, fund renovations, or build new construction. They have options to allow for advanced construction draws, new monthly loan payments, and taking a second lien position on the loan. So make sure you connect with them today if you are looking to get cash funding or if you're looking to maximize your retirement account and need to park that cash somewhere safe and allow them to invest it for you. Definitely have that conversation with them also in the back about investment options. Awesome. Now, well, cool. Hope you guys can connect with them if that might add value to your business or operation at all. Um, but without anything further, let's get to the main event tonight. So we are so excited to be joined by two investors, incredible investors with so much experience that flew in to be with us tonight. Um, I just can't wait to pick their brain about all the experience they have and, and just to hear more about what they think about the market and where it's going and, and how they're staying on top of um, successfully investing with the changes that have been happening. So we are excited to have two incredible investors who we bring into the stage. Yep. So introducing uh, tonight, Jesse Rodriguez, right? So Jesse is an extremely active investor and agent in the Southern California market. Jesse and his wife, Tina, starred in their own HG TV show, uh, Vintage Flip, where they transformed tons of vintage Southern California homes back to their former glory. He has completed over 300, 300, 300 flips so far in his career alone with running a brokerage that does hundreds of transactions each year in multiple states. And we also have Leika Devatha with us from Seattle. Uh, she runs Rehabit Homes. They focus on redevelopment of commercial and residential properties. She spearheaded about 100 million in uh, redevelopment over her career. And I gotta give a big shout out to Leika because I just recently found this out, but one of the biggest real estate conferences that happens in the country, the Bigger Pockets Conference, about 2,500 people attend. She is actually hosting that this year. So we are super excited to have these two here with us. They have traveled around the country, not only for their own business, but coming to events like this to speak. So we just can't wait to pick their brain. But we really want to make sure that they know that New Orleans is the best place that they have ever spoken. So would you guys help me? Stand to, to your feet with us and help us welcome Jesse and Leika to the stage. Jesse and Leika. Look at the shoes, look at the shoes, look at the shoes, look at the shoes. <laughs> Let's get it started. Welcome to New Orleans. We already talked a little bit about the food, so uh, I told uh, Jesse, I told Lake, you don't gain calories in New Orleans, so you could do your thing. <laughs> do your thing, All right? So, uh, Jesse, can you just give us a quick overview, real quick, of how you even got started in investing? Sure, yeah, definitely. So first off, thanks for having me. Uh, very appreciative for the invite to be here. Sounds loud. 
Um, so I got started in real estate in early 2000 as a real estate agent, mortgage professional. Um, kind of ran through that. I was 20 years old when I started. I was in college. Um, right around 2007, 8, when the market crashed, I also crashed with it. Um, did anybody here? Did the market crash or affect you? Is everybody too young for that now? Because when I used to tell the story 10 years ago, everybody could relate. Now I go into rooms and they're like, what crash? I'm like, damn. Um, so the market crashed and, uh, you know, I mean, I lived through like what a lot of people lived through. I had to short sell my house, car uh, repossessed, moved in with my wife's parents. My parents gave me a car because I didn't have a car. Um, you know, my mortgage company went under. Just kind of just, you know, down on my luck for sure. Um, the good thing is I was still kind of young when it happened. Um, my wife and I, we got married in uh, May 19th of 2007, bought our first house July of 2007, and short sold it February of 2008. So you gotta think, first six months of marriage, she picked a winner, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so the, um, I shifted and I pivoted over to selling foreclosures because it was the only thing that was happening at the time. And I, you know, I just kind of went all in. Like I was like, okay, I'm starting over, starting from scratch. What do I want to do? I was tired of mortgages and I became a real estate agent, right? Same license, but just different title. And I started selling for the banks. Ended up getting a couple hundred listings over the next couple years to a few thousand. I met a real estate investor because as an REO agent, if any of you remember those days, we had the best inventory in America. It was every home that was vacant, beat up, distressed, and a bank wanted to unload it. So I met an investor who you know, called me and said, hey, will you represent me? I'm an all-cash investor. This is 2008, 2009. And what's funny is never even heard of this concept. Like, I was like, why? Why do you want to buy it? What do you mean you're an investor? You know, and I was happy as all could be to get my $3,000 commission check and just sell this house. I didn't ask questions. And the guy's name is Richard Bash. Um, and he started buying from me. I did 20 or 30 deals that year. So he'd buy them, he'd fix them up, and he'd give them back to me to relist. And I was so happy to do this, right? Because it was just like, I was just trying to get back on my feet. Well, by 2010, at this point, I had like 700 listings for the banks. So I was kind of a big deal at that point. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, one day Richard calls me and he's like, hey, you got this property in Fontana, I want to buy it. And I'm like, you know, Richard, I would like to buy it. And he's like, okay. And I was like, oh shit, that was easy. Oh, I'm sorry. Neil, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's gonna have to earmuff a little bit, okay, baby? I'm gonna, I'm gonna cuss a little bit. Um, and, um, and so he was like, I, I knew this day was coming, didn't know why it took you so long. And I was like, well shoot, I thought you'd get mad at me. And he did not get mad at me. He encouraged me. He was expecting it. So, and he's a genius, because he goes, I'll give you the money. So he was still part of the deal without having to be part of the deal. And, uh, and that was the first house I ever flipped and I made every mistake under the sun. I bought it for 65,000. I thought my rehab would be like 15 and it ended up being like 80, you know? Um, and then, but I ended up, but it was a smoking deal and I ended up selling it for 200 and some thousand and we made a very nice profit for our first deal. And after that I was amazing and I just did thousands. No, I'm just kidding. We lost money on the next one. <laughs> So that was the, like the, the kind of the start of, of like falling in love with investing in real estate and being truly my own boss, right? That was the first time I felt even owning a real estate company and working for the banks, like they were still my boss. Like that was the day that I was like, either I'm going to mess this up or I'm going to succeed. It's only on me right now. And that was a, an amazing feeling. And it's kind of the, the high that I still rush for all the time. Oh, that was my. Leica, how about you? Could you just kind of give us a quick overview, catch us up from how did you even get started in real estate and then kind of what are you doing now? How, how has your journey taken you to where you are today? All right. Thank you for having me, you guys. Um, you are so lucky to have these two in your market because they put together a really good event. My meetups are not this fancy, just so you know. Um, okay. So I live in Seattle. I didn't know anything about real estate. I thought real estate for women meant you go out and you sell homes as a real estate broker, which nothing against it, but you don't own the real estate. You're just selling real estate. And I thought that was it. Um, so I was driving to work one day, and I was in the car, and I was listening to the radio. And on the radio, someone said you can buy an old house, and then you can fix it up, and you can sell it. 
Um, and if it doesn't turn into a disastrophe, you can make money off of that sale. Um, and so I was like, okay, that's a really cool concept. And I've never, and I grew up in India, you guys. I only moved here about 15, 16 years ago. So that whole concept of fixing up a house just didn't exist in my, in my world. Um, and so I was like, okay, let me like look into this. What does that even mean? So as the universe would have it, there was a, a seminar that was talking about flipping homes uh, that was in my town that week. And so I went to it. And my mind was blown. I was like, wow, like this actually exists. Like people do this, women do this. This is pretty cool. So then I, I mean, I had a pretty solid W2. I worked at Nordstrom Corporate. I ended up doing a three-day course. And I was like, OK, this, this is really good, because there's so many different asset classes one can do and you know, one can get involved in, multifamily, commercial, um, self-storage. And these are things that I did not know. So I said, OK, let me get the education. So I started by learning about real estate, by like educating myself, by listening to podcasts, reading books. And then within a couple months, I started my company, still had my W-2. And then I started networking with people, and I realized, you know what, everyone works when I work. The only way I would actually find a deal was if I quit my job and actually network with people nine to five. And so I quit my job, and within three months of quitting my job, I had my first house to flip. I bought this house, and much like Jesse, I thought the rehab was 65K, ended up being 125K. Yeah. And I was like, oh, OK. Um, the wholesaler that sold it to me said it was a cosmetic rehab, and it ended up being a full gut remodel. Um, and that just became my thing. I got really excited about full gut remodels. And now, fast forward to today, I've done about 100 of those, um, all in the greater Seattle market. So I take it down every single house, take it down to the studs, and then do engineering, architecture, all of that, just completely, you cannot tell from the before that that looked like the after. Um, so that's what, that's what became my jam. And then through that, I started subdividing lots, added additions to existing single family homes, bought commercial property, syndicate deals, um, and then a host of other things, so. Good stuff, I'm glad you mentioned the word uh, network. And Jesse, you took network to another level with network TV, right? So <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the HGTV uh, experience. How did, how did that even happen, and what, is, what type of impact does that type of exposure do to your career? So the HGTV thing was, it was lucky more than anything, right? I mean, there's a room full of 200 amazing investors here, and any one of you could get a show, right? I mean, definitely you can get a show, and you can get a show, and you can get a show. Um, a lot of it is, is, is just kind of timing, right place, right time. So one of my good friends was Tarek El Musa. Um, you know, we're from the same area. We started in real estate together when we were 19 years old, working at the same Remax office. And this is like before either of us were touching real estate as investors. You know, you fast forward 15 years, and he now has a show on Flip or Flop, right? This is a handful of years ago. We're still friends. He has his daughter, Taylor. I have my son, Carter, right? And just life, like we got married the same year. We had kids the same year. Um, and our wives ended up becoming really good friends. And then they started filming the TV show. And it was just this like, you know, he and I started buying, like we had uh, units together. We had like 10 or 12 different properties that we owned together. Like we were just good buddies. And one day he says, do you want a guest star on Flip or Flop? Like it'd be fun to film together. And I was like, sure, why not? You know, um, I never really seeked wanting to be on television. It wasn't something that I cared about. And which I'll say was a negative because when I filmed the show, I still didn't care about it. I always had this chip on my shoulder of like, I'm a real investor. Like, I don't wanna be a TV show investor. I don't wanna be known as that. Like, like, I love saying like, I didn't become an investor because of HETV, I was an investor and that's why HETV found me, right? So I do the show with Tarek and it was this fun episode where we're bantering over a historic house and I love historic homes and he's like, you know, a typical investor and wants to put laminate and vinyl windows and I wanted to restore the house. And just kind of this like persona was created on that episode where the producer was like, you know, you seem to really like vintage houses. Like, you know, is this what you do? And I was like, well, as often as I can in Southern California, there's not, 
you know, we're not in NOLA here where there's a vintage house on every corner, right? And so they pitched a sizzle reel to HGTV and then we got picked up for a pilot and then an eight episode first season and then a 12 episode second season and we ended up doing 23 episodes um, for HGTV and it was this just amazing rush. Um, I was like snowballed by it, like just, it was so hard doing it in the moment. I don't think I took advantage of it properly. I'm taking advantage of it now, like eight years later. Um, where I actually can breathe and go to events like this. But in the moment, I couldn't go speak at events. I couldn't, like, I wasn't focused on my uh, Instagram account to try to grow my audience and things like that. Um, but I will say that if I DM somebody, right, even though I didn't take advantage of it then because I have the blue check mark from a few years ago, I can get people to respond, right? Like, they see the message and they'll, and they'll go like, hey, what's up? Like, I can at least get that intro. Then it's from there I have to do the rest to try to see if I can convince them to actually want to meet with me, right? So it's the same tactics that we all use in trying to get a deal. I just have a little bit of an edge, I think. <laughs> um, like, a kind of similar to you question. I mean, I know it's not HGTV show, but you have also done a very similar thing of just getting in a network that has really grown your your image and your career and just the types of people you've been able to meet with. I mean, I know you're really good friends with um, like Brandon Turner who hosts the Bigger Pockets show and Investor Girl Brit and some of these people with huge accounts and followings and podcasts. So can you talk to us a little bit about like how did you get in those circles and how has that either in a positive or negative way affected your career? Yeah, um, so I was literally the only girl, I think, in my city that was flipping large homes. And so I always got like put on stage and put out there. Um, I hated public speaking. I was so terrible at it. And, you know, it was just like such a chore for me to go speak to audiences. But I kept doing it because, you know, I kept being presented with these opportunities. And one day, a friend of mine said, hey, I'm hosting this meetup. Um, it's a little mastermind in Maui with uh, Brandon Turner. And you should come. And I was like, well, who's Brandon Turner, first of all? Um, and then I was like, OK, but it's like, you know, I don't know anybody. And he's like, that's the whole point. Like, you're going to meet a whole bunch of investors from across the country. And I didn't see like the value in that because I was only playing in the Seattle market. I was like, what's the value in meeting people from outside the market? Uh, but anyway, I was like, it was a very good friend of mine. I was like, okay, I'll do it. So I ended up going to this mastermind and um, I didn't know it back then, but the mastermind was full of just amazing people. And I am so grateful I did that because it was AJ Osborne, Brian Murray, Ryan Murdoch, Investor Girl Brit, Ryan Pineda, Koru Johnson, like these are the people that are crushing it right now. And so I ended up going to this, this meetup and literally changed my life because I think back then we were all trying to find our way and because we were put in a room together, and of course there's Brandon Turner, so we were put in a room together and asked to come up with ideas to kind of um, kind of come together and do do cool things. And so out of that, Brandon and Brian Murray came together and put together the multifamily investor book. And then they started Open Door Capital. Um, and then James and I, James and I just got even more closer because I was buying deals from James Daynard in Seattle. But, you know, we were in this mastermind. We were networking outside um, outside of work. And, you know, there was Investor Girl Brit that said, oh my God, you guys don't have a social media presence and you need to have a social media, you need to have an Instagram page. Like most of us didn't even have an Instagram page. So I think we all came together and brought our strengths with us. And so, and the one common thread, I think with the, that entire group was that everybody was willing to put in the work, willing to bring the hustle. And today, I mean, each one of my friends is just like a superstar, and I'm super grateful for that. Um, and then, you know, I just it just so happened that I was talking to Brandon uh, on the beach one night, and he was like, wow, you have such a cool story. You should come on my podcast. And I was like, okay, cool. Never followed up with him. Four months later, he said, I got called out by Bigger Pockets. I got an email, and I, they said, can you fill this form out? We really want you on the Bigger Pockets podcast. Didn't know the significance of being on the podcast. I still, like, I didn't set, submit that form because I started submitting the form, and then I was like, this is a really long form, and I don't have time for this. 
so I arrived so long. It is so long. So then, you know, the producers kept reaching out to me, and I finally did it. And that was March 2020, and they shut everything down because of COVID. And I was like, you know what, that's it. Like, I'm not going to be on a podcast. It was a waste of time. But no, uh, Brandon reached out again, and they said, okay, they wanted to tape the podcast, and it ended up going live on Brandon's birthday in 2020. Um, and that, that's been just this catalyst of, you know, public appearances, deals, uh, capital, like more capital than I know what to do, do with. So then it just becomes, you know, okay, how do you take advantage of that in a way as to not over leverage yourself first, uh, but B, you know, it has to be suitable to you, your family, and just like what your beliefs are, because there's people on social media just raising capital, not knowing what they're doing, you know, doing deals that don't make sense. And it's, and then when you have access to all that capital, you just tend to go in that direction, you know, buying large apartment buildings, not knowing how to stabilize, don't know how to use your capex. So just being more um, careful. Um, so that's, you know, that's pretty much how I got into the circles and what's come out of it. Nothing nice. negative. Yeah, no, that's amazing. That your network obviously just propels you, both of you guys has given you crazy opportunities in the business. So. Um, to kind of get a little bit more into like the nitty gritty of what you guys do and how you actually got to the success that you are, um, I want to talk about your teams. So, um, Jesse, we'll start with you. What, like, I know you do a bunch of fix and flip projects. You also have a brokerage and you guys are licensed in what, like five or more states? Five states, yeah. Five states and you have hundreds of listings coming through. So with everything you have going on, like, what does your team look like? Who are your core members and what do they do? Yeah, so I've never gone away from residential real estate. Like I started such a long time ago. It's what got me to where I'm at. And I've, I've always said that if I ever exchanged my day job for investing, investing becomes my day job. Right, and it's then like I'm not gonna have that love for it. So I'm a real estate agent first. Um, I own a brokerage. I have 50 agents. I work for hedge funds. So I don't go across the kitchen table like most realtors. I work for corporate clients, investors, hedge funds. So we have almost 100 listings, or I have almost 100 listings in five states for a big single family REIT that they're always doing acquisitions and they're always doing dispos. Um, so that's kind of so to, for that I have you know, boots on the ground in every state. I've got assistants that help and do like the tasking and all the asset management portion of that. And then on, in California on the local flipping side, I've got project managers, superintendents, um, and then like basically finders that just do and they run comps all day long on deals. So we do 30 to 40 flips a year and have for many years now. Um, and to do that volume, I found that I like to have quality of life. I have three kids, three boys under 11. And I want to go home at five o'clock. I don't want to be working on the weekends anymore. I don't want to be driving for dollars, right? Popping in on open houses, like all the things that I used to do. So I realized I would rather leverage money for time. And for like the last five years, I brought on more staff than I probably needed, but it gave me the quality of life to be here with you guys, with my wife back at the hotel, you know, and we get to make a weekend out of it. Then, uh, then those late nights of, you know, during the day driving houses, you know, doing job walks at night, comping houses, you know, cause if that's what you're doing right now and you're new, like that's great. Like that's what you need to be doing so that you can get to that point where you can really grow and scale. Cause I think that's the goal for hopefully most of us. Um, but I would say, I think it's nine people is my team right now, but for various things. We have a small private capital division. So it's like three employees for like each division. Gotcha. Lega, kind of the same question. I know that you do uh, these larger commercial projects. So I want to add to that. What does your team look like? But in addition to that, how are you recruiting and keeping um, you know, fresh uh, people or making sure that the team is strong? Uh, along the way also. Okay, I'm super sorry to disappoint, uh, but I don't have any employees. Well, your team, not, not employees, yeah, but But team. I do have members that work for me, and that's the beauty of real estate. Is IRS comment right there. I do not have employees. <laughs> <laughs> they are independent contractors. I do not tell them to show up. They show up when they'd like to. Thank you, Mr. IRS. Today is April 15th. It is filing day. <laughs> 
so technical. I love you. <laughs> Thanks for calling me out, Jesse. <laughs> ED after me. <laughs> um, no, the beauty of real estate investing is that everybody has a company that, like property managers, contractors, they all have their own companies that you can contract out. So yes, I do have team members. I have multiple different builders, so different contractors for different projects. I have commercial projects that are different builders. I have single family, high-end luxury flips. Uh, those are different contractors. And apart from that, I don't manage any of my own properties. So I have property, a whole property management team. I have wholesalers that bring me deals. I have transaction uh, coordinators. I have listing brokers. I have a full CPA bookkeeping team. Um, who am I? I have a content creation team, like a social media team. Um, I have an underwriter, um, a, an asset manager, because it's like I can't keep these things straight. So I have an asset manager. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, kind of sums up my whole team. But on the commercial side, you're right. You just need a few extra people. Um, I have some lenders specific to commercial financing, uh, people that educate me all the time on bridge debt, long-term debt, uh, interest rates, you know, things like that, because it's just different. It's a different ball game. Um, and then I have uh, a whole escrow team. I have you know, their own brokerage team, because commercial brokers are very different from residential brokers and then leasing brokers, um, also very different from property, like residential property managers. To, to just kind of tag on to that too, so how, like what's your role within it? How do you fit in, like what's your kind of day-to-day -day tasks? Um, I feel like I'm the puppet master. <laughs> I am constantly pulling strings. I am looking at it from the top down. Um, I try to only be there for when I'm most needed, because otherwise I just get sucked into the everyday nitty gritty stuff. Uh, but I'm mostly analyzing deals, you know, thinking about how to change my strategy based on the market conditions, uh, and then finding those deals that match those strategies, networking with uh, people that can find me those deals, people that can finance those deals, people that can really take my business to the next level. That's, that's, my, that's my goal and my role. Yeah, Jesse, kind of same thing for you, not the IRS answer either. What, what's your data, what's your day to day look like in the role that you are yeah. in now, you know, with your, with your team? Uh, first thing I want to point out though is you can see we run kind of different models, but we're both successful and I love that. Like that, like that is the purpose of venturing off into being an investor is you get to build the business you want, right? Like, I, I love, like, like, I want that version of it. I think I'm just a little too controlling still. And I like having people, like, like until COVID, I was like, no, you cannot work from home. <laughs> I was like, we're working in this office, in one room, my desk is in the middle, everybody's around, and it's like a composer. Like, let's go, did we buy that house? Did we talk to that person? Like, that's the energy that, that I enjoyed. Um, now, my role is I'm, I'm still very active. <laughs> um, I don't show up to the office anymore because of COVID. It taught me that everybody can work from home, so I think that was a blessing. I think everybody has a better quality of life. Um, I enjoy working from home, um, which is really cool because I never thought I would. But I definitely, like, I'm checking my email every single day. I'm, you know, juggling multiple balls um, and just trying to, you know, be the glue that kind of keeps it together. You know, I think the one part when you're into like a, such a high relationship business like we're in, you have to stay connected or, you know, you lose the deals. Um, and for I've had like right hand people over the years that have then spun off from me and have taken relationships with them because, you know, you might have. Mill might have brought me a deal, and then I passed them on to my, my right hand to go walk that house, and then before you know it, Mill's calling my right hand instead of me, and then two years later, Mill doesn't call me anymore at all, and this guy left, and that's happened to me about three times now. So I've now realized, like, you still have to have the right hand, or you have to do it if you want to scale, but you have to make sure that you know how to not lose the relationship with the contacts because like this event right is creating relationships with all of you so one of you hopefully will send me a deal in california and it's like well i, I want to value that relationship i want to make sure that i'm there for you when you need me and not just like yeah just talk to alex 
you know, and make you feel not like not important and stuff like that. And I think those are the mistakes that I made over time. So I'm still trying to stay at least a high level touch. Like I don't think anybody expects me to be the one to comp the house anymore, but just to be able to be the one to return the phone call and say, thank you for sending it. And you know, I've got Alex, he's going to run it and then call you back with a, like, okay, this is where I think the number needs to be, you know, things like that. But I mean, I do a huddle every Monday with the team. We use Slack for communication. Um, we've really been moving to more technology to try to get us to be more like virtual and, uh, and, and my people all overlap. So they do like a little bit of everything so that if someone gets sick, that like all the businesses still can continue to run. Yeah, gotcha. I'm deals and relationships. So what does is, what is acquisitions look like right now filling up that pipeline? Like where are the deals coming from? Like to walk us through the, the past 12 months. What did last year look like with execution and filling up that pipeline on the acquisition side? Well, Neil, can we talk like last 36 months? Maybe last 12 weren't that great. <laughs> You know, last 12, I like to not to think about those. No, so um, in early, you know, 2022, um, you know, I, I think I saw the market shifting pretty quick. Like, I, I think I'm a little bit more, I hate to say, like negative, but I'm constantly looking for the bottom to drop after what happened to me in 2008. I'm cautious, like, not wanting to uh, over double down. And so early 20, like, like January, I was like, I had a team meeting. I was like, we're not buying any more flips. We're gonna run through our, we need to push through our pipeline before we keep filling because there's an addiction that comes when you're a flipper. We are addicts. Like if you don't know, like I'm not an alcoholic, but I am a flipping real estate investor addict. There's never been a city that I haven't visited that I haven't driven the neighborhoods thinking like, should I, should I buy a house here? Like, you know, like, I mean, Dom and I did that on Friday. I'm like, show me your flips. I wanna see what you're doing. I wanna analyze this. And, um, and so I had 17 homes in January of 2022 in my pipeline. And I said, we need to push through this or I think we're gonna go under, right? Cause you're always, like it doesn't matter how much money you make, you make a hundred million this year, you fucking leverage 200 million. Like that is, that is our business. And so I'm so thankful that I had the foresight, foresight. Now I will say that I saw other people continue to flip around me and they did great, right? Cause as everybody was slowing down like me, the investors that were willing to stay in got some good deals. Right, and then we saw the market like it stalled for a little bit, but then like right now it's booming again. And so I literally, like the hardest year of my life was 2022, more than when I went under. And not because of losses, but because do you know how hard it is to say no to a flip? Like, I mean, it is like insecurity central that year. My wife had to be like, it's okay, babe. That wholesaler will call you back. So I'm like, no, he won't. I fucking keep telling him no. Like, I gotta buy something, even if it's a bad buy, right? Like, it's like, I mean, it was like telling everybody no, like to where they stopped calling. Cause they're like, Jesse's out. I wonder what's going on. Oh, he's probably getting divorced, right? Like, it's like, I mean, the rumors start to happen. <laughs> it's just, it has nothing to do with it. And you're like, you know, and you're just trying to be smart. So it was a, a year that I I said, okay, we're not going to flip. Sorry, I talk a lot. So we're not going to flip. We're going to run through our inventory. I want to put cash back in the bank, right? I want to take some chips off the table and then just see where it lands. And I got to the fourth quarter of 22 and I was down to like maybe six houses. Like, you know, I got through 10 of them because they were all large, large projects. And I said, okay, I'm ready again. Like I feel okay. There's enough money in the bank that I can go back out. And if the market shifts on me, I will survive this. And I think that is that I will never put my family. I didn't have kids when I lost everything in 2008. I cannot do that to them now, right? Can, and you, if that can means, you really quick just give us like a, a context? Like you had 17 flips. Like what does that look like? How much is invested in average in each one? Yeah, so it's my average purchase price is about 900,000. Average rehab is probably 200, 225,000. So I mean, it was probably, I don't know, $19 million out or something like that. Like, like when I went with Dom on Friday and she's like, I bought this for 68. I was like, that I was like 68 what? <laughs> I was like, oh dang, I want 10 like, or, or, or 12. Like what does that equal to 900 dollars? Like I don't even know what the math is on that, right? Like I was like, and, um, and so, 
yeah, you know, it's like so eye-opening to come to like another state and go like, man, this is awesome, and I'm so impressed with like what Emil and and Dom do and how they're fl- like. You can make money anywhere. It's like the most special industry that I've ever experienced, and it's like, it's like, you know, no matter how hard it gets. And this is the thing. If I don't know how, can, can you know, like who's flipping houses here has done at least one. Okay, that's a good amount. Like, and it is hard. Like, I don't know if people talk about how hard it is. Like, it's like meetups I now realize are like, um, we call it like groups when you're, it's like an AA meeting in here right now. I'm like, hi, my name's Jesse, I flip houses, I need to stop. You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but to so answer your question, Don, it's a lot of money. It's a lot, and that Richard Bash character, don't be Googling him, by the way. Um, that's still my money guy today. That's still, still my mentor and still my money partner, I mean, 15 years later, which is like insane, right? And it's like, he was loyal to me, I'm loyal to him. Very cool. Um, Like a little bit of a background for you, maybe let's go back a little more than 12 months in case you had a similar (laughs) experience with Jesse, but say the last like, Two, three years, yeah. what, what has been the average like deal flow for you? How do you fill your pipeline? Where are you finding deals? What's, what's your go-to strategy? My go-to strategy is go to wholesalers. I don't know how to do direct mail. I really am terrible at that. So uh, what I'm good at is networking with like-minded people. And so I go to meetups, but really I buy deals from the same people. I've been buying deals for about nine, 10 years now. Um, So I go to the same wholesalers, actually they come to me with stellar deals and um, I just like literally have not had any problem filling my pipeline. So I think I've bought about 20 flips in the last two years, Um, uh, two apartment buildings, uh, about four or five small multi, which is two to four units. Um, I just got on a contract for a Dadu build. Uh, and then also bought a sick office building in downtown Seattle. Ooh, yeah. Sick, sexy. Sick, sexy. <laughs> Same difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, literally, I don't go look on the MLS. I actually, fi- my wholesalers find deals on the MLS, get it under contract, and then bring it to me. And I'm okay with that because I often make the most amount of money from the deals that are, my wholesalers bring me rather than the deals that I found on the MLS myself because I overpay. Because I'm like, I have to, I have to have this. Um, totally. Also such an addict. So <laughs> have to have this. Let me pay 100K over asking. And then I end up making 30K on the, on the back end. Instead, my wholesaler that knows how to get a deal under contract gets it for 120K less. Because whatever the asking price is, he goes in there and he negotiates. He gets it for 20K less than the, the asking price. So then now I have paid way less for it. I give them a full 3% commission on the back end, which means I don't have to list my, I'm a broker too, but I think I, I do way, uh, I, I just get way more advantages just fixing up the house rather than selling the property. So then I have someone else representing me. Uh, also can be a legal issue if you represent yourself as the flipper when you haven't sometimes pulled a permit. Are you with the FBI? <laughs> <laughs> That's my day job. This is someone who's been sued. I'm going to tell you that right now because she is very legal. (laughs) Um, But I I want to hear from you guys, especially the people that have flipped a house. What is your acquisition price? What is your average acquisition price? Woman in the white. Just scream out a number. Scream out a number. 175. 175. What are you fixing it up for? Uh, It's a multifamily. So how many units? How many units? Five. For 175, five units? That's the cost of my kitchen cabinets for five <laughs> units. <laughs> wow. It requires 70,000 though, but the AR- Yeah. Per unit. Per unit? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, 70,000 total. Total, okay, and then. You need a partner? <laughs> Call Richard Bash. <laughs> Shh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you'll take a partner? Okay, but wait, once it's fixed up, I know you want to hold it long term. What is it going to be worth? Um, so there's a sole comp for 430 in the area. It's awesome. I'm going to, there's multiple reasons. I'm going to do a cash shop refi, then go and turn around and do something else. And I'm holding it, and it's going to be, it's own business. So I'm setting it up. 
Sweet. Uh, reselling in an LLC with the DSDR loan. Mm-hmm. It's going to be its own business, so then I can turn around for 12 months to do a bank statement loan and purchase something else. Yeah. Good for you. Sounds like a good burr. It's a burr. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a 55. What's the rent on that? I'm curious. Um, if, so I'm going to midterm it. Um, but if I were to rent it, the all five units will bring me uh, 5800 Okay, guys. So she bought this deal for... 175, she's putting in 70K, it's gonna be worth 430, and she gets a monthly income of 5,800. Okay. Can I move to NOLA? <laughs> now we know why Dom is flipping here from Colorado. From Colorado, right? Like she's the smart one in the room. <laughs> That's awesome. But thank you. Thank you for that. Good stuff. So y'all already told us about what the operations look like. Alice version, right? So tell us, Jesse, tell us about the, the one or two mistakes that really stick out, like from when you got started to now. So we got new people in the room that's never done a deal, and we got people that's trying to scale up and do more deals. So what's a mistake uh, that you would share with somebody that you would hope that they can avoid? So. You know, when I first started, the mistakes were, it was like not knowing how to work with contractors or underestimating rehabs, right? And you have to go through that. Like, you're never just going to be perfect. You're always going to underestimate. That's why you have to make sure you're buying a great deal, right? The spread's got to be really big to compensate for that. As you get better is actually scarier, right? Because it's like, I was more on it when I was new than I am now when I'm doing 30 or 40 in a year because you're always trying to say yes. You always need, like you start to build a machine that says, well, I need to produce a couple hundred thousand a month to keep feeding the machine, right? Employees and costs. Um, and so you, you know, could buy a bad buy or something that's a little too tight and try to force the equity in that deal. And I think that's the biggest thing that's kind of hurt me, I'd say, over the last couple of years. It's, it's only happened once or twice, but it's definitely like an emotional purchase. You know, sometimes you find a property or a neighborhood that you love, like a neighborhood you grew up in, um, or it's a historic neighborhood, and you're like, man, I love this town. This, I wanna flip here. And you start to break the rules for your buy box. And that is something that you cannot do. You have to have a buy box. It doesn't mean it doesn't change over time, right? Because it will change. But whatever it is, you have to stick to it. Like we were on vacation a couple years ago and I bought a house in Park City. I told you, there's never been a city that I didn't love a house. So we're in Park City on vacation with my family and I bought a home off the MLS or off Redfin. I called the agent and I was like, I'm gonna make this a big, beautiful house and do an addition. And you know, two years later on this rehab and the headaches of not knowing the city Right, how complex it is that, that it's you know it's a mining town and the the HPOZ or the historic parts of it, and it's like taking two years and I'm bleeding on it and I put like six hundred thousand, and then I'm like, shit, I just want to sell this. Like I just want to get out, right? And so, and that was all emotions. Like I should have never bought that house. Like what the hell was I doing? Like right? But it's you get to a point where you go like, I can't make a mistake. Right, like too big to fail almost. Um, and so I would say that that was, I, I, I'm happy it happened because it really kind of just, you know, did an ego check for me of like, you can fail. And this happened pre 2022. And I think that's a lot why my feelings in January where I was so cautious. Because if not, I, I probably would have steamrolled right through 2022 with like no fear. Right. And um, so I, I think the, like the biggest thing for everyone in this room is figure out your buy box and do not deviate. And if you don't know how to figure out your buy box, I mean, they can help you figure it out, right? Like you need to figure out what it's gonna take. If you're paying all cash, then you can pay a little bit more than someone who needs to finance, right? Like it's, but it's like once you figure that out, to be able to say no to a deal is the greatest asset that you could have to yourself, is to say no, you don't want it. Yep, I like that a lot. Um, what about for you, like, uh, has there ever been any any stories, any deals that have maybe gone not as you planned or lost money or something that you, you know, really took away a big learning lesson from? Never. <laughs> Are you sure I you're wish, uh, actually I wish. investing? If you ever met a real estate investor that said that they never failed or didn't have a bad deal, run in the opposite direction because they're lying. 
Um, yes, so many lessons learned. Um, I love that about the buy box. Uh, absolutely crushed it uh, on that one because same like you know I figured out that I wanted to do large scale remodels and that's all I did and honestly it was hard to fail at that until deal number 37 I knew my buy box I knew my market how could I fail ended up buying a house and market conditions changed um, Amazon is a huge contributor of to my market and Amazon introduced a new head tax and Literally overnight, everyone stopped buying homes. And so, and I had this house that I was way over, it was way over rehabbed because the city made us, like the city kept coming back, you know, uh, doing inspections and making us change so much in the house that I was way over my rehab budget. And then I couldn't sell it for the price I wanted to sell it for. And I lost 65 grand on that house. Um, now I can walk away and say, I made no mistakes. I bought the house, I had a great ARV. I knew my market, I know what a hot market that is, but I could have done a bunch of other things. I could have looked into short-term rent renting it, I could have done mid-term rentals, I could have done different exit strategies, like look at it from a different lens on, okay, how can I hold this long-term? Like, why take a loss, you know? Um, so I think, you know, when you walk into a deal, very early on, understand your market, because if you know your market, you can really play to the strengths of that market, and then learn to analyze a deal from different points of view. You know, um, can I put another house on it? Can I convert this into a multifamily zoning? Can I build something else out of it? Can I build a second story? Can I rent by room? There's so many different uh, exit strategies that you can now come up with. It's amazing, like can, you can, Convert it into an assisted living house. You can do a, um, a rehab house. Like there's just so many different tactics. So when you start analyzing deals, start to analyze. Like even on your first deal, analyze it as though you couldn't flip it, and you bought the deal. And then what else can you do with it? Um, I think the other thing is a lot of people go into like especially the ones going from doing one thing into the next thing, and you want to scale, you want to grow because Everybody needs to grow, but do it wisely. Do it with a great network in place. Do it with lots of resources, because I went down this rabbit hole of subdividing a lot. So I bought a house to flip. I um, decided, like, uh, not decided, but I discovered that I could subdivide the lot. So I was like, wow, that is the highest and best use of this lot, and I'm going to go ahead and do that. Took me four years to do it. Four years and a lot of hard lessons. Now, I did make a huge profit. I made a seven-figure profit off of that. But if you told me to do that again, I would run away. I would be like, no way, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. Because it's just, it was so hard. And there's so many easier ways to make that same amount of money. So also look at the situation in front of you. It could be a situation. Or it, you know, <laughs> um, but I, I, I would say just look at it from different angles and see what is, what is within your power to do it. Awesome. Um, wanted to pick your guys' brain a little bit on the market and the conditions you've been seeing. Jesse, uh, you kind of mentioned already, like you kind of stopped buying last year um, and that you were seeing a change in the market. So can you just talk to us a little bit about that, like? What were you seeing, and then what have you actually seen play out? So the big thing was with interest rates going up so much, right? It was a consumer confidence thing. They, they jumped out of the market. They didn't want to buy. And we saw such a stall. We saw the market price, at least in Southern California, go down 15% from second quarter to fourth quarter. I can happily say that we have are done falling which was huge. And that's kind of what I'm so happy that I pulled out because instead of buying something in the second quarter, my target by the fourth quarter because it was dropping now I'm back in I'm like pushing super hard to try to refill my pipeline because I do feel that we've hit that new false bottom and I think there's a lot of money to be made now what's interesting is that there's still not as many investors coming back in I think a lot of them that didn't pull out when I pulled out are licking their wounds right now um, you know, and, and you're kind of hearing that if you go on bigger pockets you're hearing that people are saying that it's hard to burn now right? Because interest rates are so high. The DSCR loans don't make sense. Um, but 
someone told me a long time ago, I won't say his name, but it, it rhymes with Ash, uh, my Richard mentor. Bash, guys. <laughs> That when, when the herd is fleeing, it's when you need to enter, right? And when everybody's entering, it's when you need to get out. And that is always, always true. When you're telling yourself, I'm scared and I don't want to do this right now, right? Which is hence the market being bad and scary. Like, like there's so many investors that are tight on capital because their investors don't want to give them money right now, or they're over leveraged currently with the deals that they have. They don't even want to finish their rehabs right now because they know once they put them on the market, they're going to lose, right? So they're like stalling and they're like, I'm just going to keep paying this 9% rate and see if I can figure it out. And hopefully the market will, will make up for itself that I feel like, man, I want to jump in. Like I'm a Panther right now. What can I buy? Who can I take advantage of? What wholesaler has got too much inventory or made a bad decision and closed on something instead of canceling that deal? Um, so I think it's a phenomenal time to buy, right? I think one thing is obviously tighten your buy box too. I tightened mine a long time ago. Like I was like, it's just the deals need to be better and better and better. Cause if I'm going to go through the headaches and the possible loss, right? Or the risk of the loss now, it's like, it better be worth the upside better be huge. Um, and I'm, and I'm seeing that like I actually really am. And I think most of my friends in the marketplace with me, cause we're all, you know, we talk a lot and we help each other. We're all seeing that we're seeing six figure returns. And like, like I thought we were going to make a hundred. Now we're going to make 200 on a deal. Right. And that's what it felt like two years ago when you thought you were going to make a hundred and made 200. But last year you thought you were going to make a hundred and you lost 50. Like the swings were bad. So, um, I mean, I think the timing is phenomenal right now. I don't know Nola. But I think in Southern California, it is so good. Buyer confidence is up. Everybody's accepted the fact the rates are the rates. They're 6%, they're 7%. You know, they were on the fence for six months. At some point people go, well, we need to buy, right? Not like rents are going down. So might as well own it. Might as well get some tax write-offs, right? All the positives. So um, I think it's a great time to be an investor, really. Lika, uh, same question. So in your space, kind of what, what do you feel like, um, what, what has this shift been looking like for you and uh, what, what's your take on the shift? You know, in the Seattle market, we had a very short amount of time for the shift uh, where people were just getting used to all oh, these high interest rates. Same thing, like we have some solid tech jobs that drives the economy and so we've had good people with great credit that have the capital to go buy real estate, uh, to go buy their second home or like, you know, the move up buyers that want to um, escalate their home buying to maybe something a little bit bigger. And so we, we did have a little stall in the market, but then we're back full swing and we don't have inventory. So uh, the flips that I put on the market, like in the last two months, literally stayed on the market for four days and then end up selling. So we're pretty much back, but also in my market, the strategy for investors is shifting a little bit because uh, we've had a few builds pass, so we can build ADUs, DADUs in the backyard. Uh, we have another build that if it passes, then all single family zoning can be converted to small multifamily, so we can build two to four units. So not just build one DADU, but we can actually build four units on that same lot. So it's pretty spectacular. Now everyone's going after single family lots because if that build does pass, then super easy to build three more units. Um, and yes, interest rates are super high. So as long as we can build more and we can make more rental income, then that kind of mitigates the interest rate problem. So uh, that's kind of where my whole buying criteria is also shifting is to go find those lots that enable these, these types of construction. Yeah. Are you guys able to do accessory dwelling units here in the state? No, yeah. no detail. Okay, so it's also in California. We've had that, oh. I don't know, I think it's like 2017 or something. So every home you buy, you can do an attach like up to 600 square feet attached to the house and up to 1,200 square feet detached. So every single family could have been turned into a triplex basically. Um, which was a very big like forced equity play that we've seen mm -hmm. and the bill you're talking about us about splitting the lots that passed for us already mm -hmm. It's called SB 9. So every lot 
can be split so that you have two lots so that you can now have multiple units on both. And we're talking like tiny lots, like in neighborhoods that you should not have multifamily, it's now allowed because we have such a uh, homeless problem. Inventory crisis uh, well, and homeless. The homeless issue is why yeah. Los Angeles created this. Um, but really, investors are just tackling it to make money. This is killing me. I don't know. I don't know about him. I'm not doing it to make money. I'm doing it to add more units to, um, uh, you know, to increase affordable housing. So. <laughs> Jesse. A softie. <laughs> um, I'm curious to know for you guys then, with all this stuff going on in your markets, especially. Uh, what, what are you guys looking ahead at? Like, what are you seeing coming up in the market as far as the next 12 to 24 months? Where do you see the market going? Where do you see yourself in particular going with the market? Like, um, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so I started buying larger multifamily, you know, apartment buildings and whatnot. But then with just the way the debt is structured for those, uh, it's impossible to make positive cash flow, especially when you have a bunch of syndicators or investors in your syndication that you need to pay out. Um, and so I'm going to stay away from that. Um, I don't need to have more investors. I'm going to do more with less. And so I'm going to go the route of you know building DADUs and ADUs on small single family residential lots. And I think, like Jesse said, I love residential real estate. I like flipping homes, I like holding them as long-term rentals, I like Airbnbs, and so that's kind of my focus too, is just you know, going back into just increasing more units in the residential space. Um, so yeah, same thing for me. It's, I, I'm such a fan of single family. I mean, I sell for Invitation Homes, which is the largest single family REIT hedge fund in, in the country. And they have 80,000 single family. And I always tell myself, I'm like, well, I'm definitely not smarter than those Harvard grads, right? So why am I trying to like rethink this? If, if buying single family is something that works for them, I mean, they created it as an asset class now um, where it's not just the small mom and pop investor. It's like, why wouldn't we do the same exact thing? Um, now I am venturing a little bit wild in the sense that I, I'm starting to do some like commercial stuff, like a little shopping center that's nine units, but a community center, right? Not like a target, like nothing like that. Um, and then also doing some adaptive reuse since I love historic properties. So buying an old packing house, um, you know, from the like early 1900s and doing an adaptive reuse and making it a food hall. So like starting to create other businesses within like, you know, buying the property for half a million, investing 10 million in like the remodel and the restoration, getting um, tax credits from, from like federal tax credits. Mm -hmm. So they actually were not paying as much on the property taxes so that our net effective purchase price is way less. Like some little bit bigger type kind of fun, you know, sexy stuff that's cool for the portfolio. Um, good for the community because it's going to be like a really neat like project. Like I want some stuff that I can put my name on and be proud of. You know, someday drive with the kids and be like, shit, we own that, you know, like, um, and so like a mix of that. But like, I think flipping is something that I will never not do. Like, I'll be like 82 years old and be like, I flip houses, you know, like. <laughs> I love that because I'm the same way. I love I, it. Like, I, I can't, it is a drug. It is a drug. It, yeah, it's like, and I got my, my 11 year old is like, so how much are we making on that one? You know, like. <laughs> Like my son Carter is already talking about like, so when I take over the business, I think we need to be a little bigger. And I'm like, yes, like you need to have that energy because dad doesn't have that like anymore. Like you need to take us to 500 a year or something. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, like, I love the idea of multifamily, but I, I actually don't like tenants that much. So I, I struggle with them, I, you know. It's a cow. Oh, you can't get rid of a tenant in California. Yes, we we are not a landlord friendly state. Um, so I only own like three rentals right now. Like I'm I'm a flipper. Like I'm addicted to the flip. I can't justify collecting two hundred bucks on a place when I can like flip it and make fifty thousand and be like, I can make forty percent on my money or I can make three percent on my money. But in fifty years, this is gonna make sense. You know, like it's like so. But I know it's not wrong because I have friends that did buy when I was just flipping and now they have like 70 doors and I'm like, damn, that all should have probably listened to, you know? Again, there's no wrong way to do this. Like that is the thing. Like 
Eddie, Eddie, man, just pick your way and just stick with it. Or change it out. Do an adaptive reuse. <laughs> Food haul. Oh, damn, that's going to be a bad deal. I know it, too. <laughs> it's going to be totally, like, so cool on paper. It's going to be amazing. I'm losing my butt on that thing. It is awesome. Come eat at the spaghetti factory. <laughs> Well, we headed, uh, we, we're about to wrap up in a bit uh, before we take questions because we got to get downstairs to the bar. But uh, to, <laughs> to the both of you, yeah. Uh, for the people in the room, you know, that never did a deal yet, uh, what, what's your advice or what's the one thing that you wish you would have known uh, that you know now? Well, okay, so I think if you're not doing a deal, a deal it's fear. More than likely, right? Like, I'm sure whoever has not done a deal is it because you're scared? And you're scared because you have a lack of knowledge. Like, that is the, like, fear is just based on knowledge. Knowledge comes from being in groups like this, from partnering with someone. I mean, I'm 15 years into business and I still have Bash as my partner on money. Some deals we do together, others I do by myself. But I call him probably on every deal still and say, Bash, what do you think of this property? I'm not sure. And Bash's job is to tell me that it sucks. And I swear to God, every single time, I don't like it. Why? I'm like, why? I get all offend offended, right? Like, I own it. And he's like, I don't know. I just don't agree with the, I don't like the roof line on it. Like, something stupid, right? And I'm like, are you crazy, dude? Like, this comp, this comp, this. And by the time I'm done, like, arguing and get frustrated with him, he goes, the fact that you're passionate, I, it's, good, it, it's a deal. He's like, because I am like, do you like this deal? And he's like, not really. I'm like, me either. You know, like, so he knows if I'm willing to fight to try to convince him and get his approval, that I'm really convincing myself. I wasn't really asking for his approval, right? So, like, you guys need to find that. And it's like too many people want to be greedy and don't want to partner with someone because they don't want to share in it, right? But if I bring experience and you bring the deal, that is a great partnership. Right now, I'm not gonna bring the deal, bring the money, and bring the experience because I don't need you. Right, like <laughs> at that one. So you gotta just jump in. Like it was scary when I did it 14 years ago, right, or 10 years ago, whatever it was. It was scary when you did your first deal. Let me tell you a little secret. It's fucking scary every deal I still do. It's never not scary. She, would you lose 60 grand? You said. How much did you lose on that deal? 30, 60? 65. I lost 300,000 on my deal. Yeah, I'm way smarter. Three, <laughs> and per year, right? you got the whole package. Um, I lost 300 and no regrets. Because I fucking have made millions on other deals, right? Over 10 years. Like, it's going to happen. Guess what? I learned a lot. Don't buy on emotions, right? Don't buy just in a vacation city that I love to go to. Just go stay in a damn hotel. <laughs> you know, like... Like, buy where the deal makes sense. Do not buy based on like, oh man, I really want to make the deal make sense. The deal just needs to make sense. Flipping is not gambling because we actually, if you buy right, there should be very low risk, right? You should only not work because of a pandemic or because of something like that. But if you're buying at a 90% of ARV and you're like, I think it's going to work. I can keep my rehab really low. Like, it's like, oh, you're crazy. Like, come on. You need to buy at 65% ARV or 70 or 75 or, you know, whatever works for you in your market based on rehab. But it's like, get your ass in the game. Stop being scared, right? Go find a damn deal, too. Like, it's like, oh, well, I don't know how to do it. Cause I, well, you got to find a deal. Yeah. Like, whoever the biggest investor is here, maybe it's up here. Like, you want them to work with you? You got to find the deal. You gotta bring them the deal. Because they don't need you for the deal, they have their own deals, and they have capital, and they have it all, right? But you bring a deal, you have value. Like, I love you when you have a deal. Like, we're friends. Like, let's go to dinner, let's hang out, I will drop all my knowledge on you. I will put the hell out of you. I will tell you stories that you can't fucking believe. Oh, you guys will walk out of this room, I won't stop talking, right? <laughs> Teed that up for you. No, I love say love what he said. What he said. <laughs> Literally what he said. I was going to say, find the deal, find a mentor. And that's it. That's your like, sure shot way um, to success. Uh, but if you have already found the deal, if you have already done a few deals, then just constantly network. Because that's the only way you can grow your portfolio, grow your cash flow, grow your money and then grow yourself. So just keep educating yourself and meeting new people that can take you to that next level. 
Awesome. Um, I think we're going to open it up, if it's okay with you guys, for a couple minutes just for Q&A. Um, yeah. If there's anything that we kind of didn't cover. So um, if anyone has any questions. It was like, what about the bar? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the bar. You can roll the bar up here. Come on. <laughs> uh, if there are any questions, uh, just shoot your hand up. And do you want to maybe walk around or something yeah. uh, with the mic? And when we'll bring it over for the questions. Hi, I was actually wondering, do you have any, um, like, a, an outlook or an opinion on what might happen to office space and what we can do with office space? Well, oh. No, you go So I just bought a seven-unit office building, and I, I bought it in 2021. I remodeled it. I thought I was going to spend 160. I spent 400K. Uh, but... The good news is that I picked location over anything else um, because it wasn't about immediate cash flow or appreciation, it was more long-term. Like That was one of those trophy properties that I just had to have because you don't find those deals. So if you're gonna go look for office buildings, like go find those deals. My building is right next to Facebook and Amazon, same street. Um, and so my the top floor of my office building has killer views of the lake and it just wasn't getting leased. So. Um, it was ready to lease out last September. By November, like we literally didn't have anyone wanting to lease it because it was, it's kind of a larger space and it's a cool space. Um, so, but the building doesn't have an elevator. So I was like, okay, how do I start generating income? So I started hosting my real estate meetups at that space. And next week I'm gonna launch it as an event space. And we already have like a few few different bookings on it, but people want to do weddings and dinners and corporate luncheons. And so I think if you can get creative with it, do co-working spaces, you know, um, put it up on Pure Space and Party Slate and see if if you can actually generate income that way. Because it's great to get a long-term triple net lease, but in lieu of that, especially for the time being, where you know office is so stagnant. Uh, try to do other cool things. Have a Zoom meeting space, like whatever it is. But just bring more people to the event space or the office building. Damn, my mic. That was a really good comment. You're right. Like you're like you're recreating what it could be, right? By putting the business there. Um, I think office is fine. Like I think there's just too much hype around. Oh my God, nobody's gonna go to office. I mean, it's like we're already seeing it that companies are like, hey, you should just come in if you want, but you have to. You, you, like, you know what I mean? Like, I think companies realize that they can work virtually a little bit, but we're not going to see, like, you know, here in downtown New Orleans, all these buildings go vacant now all of a sudden. There's always going to be a new company that's going to need space. Um, with an established company, you can work from home because you have the synergies in place. I think it's going to be fine. I think it's going to be fine. <laughs> I think it's going to be fine, and I think we're going to see a lot of... No, I'm okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I think there's going to be a lot of adaptive reuse that happens in office as well. So we're already starting to see that like office spaces are being converted into multifamily. <clears throat> it's a lot more expensive to do because it doesn't meet like egress requirements and things like that. But developers are going to figure it out because the cost to buy land in certain places is so expensive that if you can <coughs> buy an office building that's now 50% vacant, the cap rate's gonna end up being really bad on it, so the price has to go down because you cannot get a commercial loan on it because the debt service doesn't cover, right? So that, that's how commercial works. So by default, the price is gonna come down. You now have the opportunity that you can bring in the forced equity or the value add to it, and then you can convert it to like now housing or event spaces, right? Co-working spaces, things like that. So, Who What's that? Food halls. Food halls, <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> Places where we, so like my food hall, where we can charge $10 a foot instead of $2 a foot, like a normal thing, because we're creating this environment and space where we're bringing in thousands and thousands of people to the food hall, right? And now all you have to do is hopefully have decent food and maybe they'll go to your line instead of your line, right? It's the food court of the mall from the 90s, now in a cool location, Right, with music and things like that. So that is an adaptive reuse idea that's happening in a hundred year old building that's been vacant and it's had like, you know, just been, you know, tattered over all the years. These office buildings may start to see that, right? We've seen office buildings that have been boarded up for years. This is not a new thing. It's just the media's talking about it like it's new. I love that commercial real estate is, is in pain right now. There is no better time to buy real estate than right now. 
if you can buy a deal like your fourplex or five unit and make the burr work on your 9% DSCR loan that you're going to get, because that's probably going to be the rate, right? What happens in a year or two years from now when you get to ride the wave down? That deal that's cash flowing a thousand bucks cash flows you two thousand. Well, what we've seen in the last five years is everybody buying on low rates, and now all these loans are starting to reset, and now they're struggling, and banks are starting to call their notes due, right? They're taking them over. So the opportunity for us to buy something, like just buy a better deal, run your numbers, have a performa, figure out how to make it cash flow, and if it doesn't cash flow, do not buy it. Like it's that simple. Then when you refinance it in a year or two, because everybody's speculating rates are gonna go back down to the fives or so here in the next 24 months, hopefully, now you just doubled your cash flow, right? You doubled your revenue, like it's huge. Like this feels to me like 2008, nine and 10, other than the prices are not cheap like they were before, but it still feels like there's a lot of opportunity. I don't think we're gonna see the market drop to 2008. Maybe it drops if it does crash or recession or depression or whatever the fuck other eschen there is out there, <laughs> right? Like the one thing I'm passionate about is just get the hell out there and do it. Like stop sitting on the dark fence, right? Be smart, buy smart, you'll be okay. That's right. Next question. Thank you guys so much for being here tonight and giving us your information. For, I'd love for y'all to come talk at our city council and government meetings because <laughs> we need help in getting things zoned and Airbnb help. Because this, uh, we is, all do. it's terrible here. Can terrible. City I can't find Whew, man, yeah. like y'all's at least talked some sense into changing the single families into being able to build more structures on the property. Like, like they don't even want to hear it here. But anyway, that's different. So what, what, what are the Airbnb markets look like in your um, areas? Look like meaning, are they like supply and demand? Like, like supply and demand, legal standpoint, zoning, stuff like that. Yeah, I think um, definitely a lot more standardization. Um, we, as a homeowner today, even as an investor, you can't have multiple Airbnb properties. Before you could have seven, eight, nine, ten. Today you can only have one. Yeah, so, you know, it keeps changing, so you have to adapt to it. But you can do midterm rentals. Those don't count towards your short-term rental market. So you can do midterm rentals. You can do um, traveling nurse homes. Uh, you can do ADA-compliant homes. So there's a few different opportunities. So in Southern California, if you're in a resort community, like a mountain community, a desert, or a beach, it's still allowed. For, for the most part, right? Because it's a vacation community. I, I'm not familiar here. I assume it's probably allowed, like in the French Quarter area? Oh, I would have guessed if there was any place because there's so many people that come through here, so that'd be a great opportunity. All right, well, this city sucks. Um, but I see we, okay, I'm gonna show up to your city council meeting because that's ridiculous. Um, you know what, I say California sucks 99% of the time, but at least they're allowing, if it's a vacation destination, that's what VRBO was was based on, right? Um, they don't allow it in like regular residential communities. They don't want, you know, that constant transient type thing where somebody's coming in, they're rolling their suitcase every three days, um, which I'm fine with that. Like, I'm, I'm good. Like, you know, there's some stuff that needs to probably stay, stay the way and, and that's okay. So um, I've had seven or eight Airbnbs over the years. I have one right now. Um, and I find it that you can still make a lot of money in Airbnb if you just buy in the right community. You know, um, Airbnb numbers have fallen off a lot, right? Like the stays are down, um, the price per night are down. So my gut tells me it's probably a great time to invest in it, right? Because if the herd is leaving, I want to go in. So I think too many people jumped into Airbnb last few years. They crushed it during COVID. Now they're hurting. They overpaid, right? So probably a great time to get in there because my expectation, I don't need $500 a night, right? Like that person who bought and underwrote it at 500 a night, can I buy it for less? I'm good at 350 a night. It's still cash flows, right? So I think there's an opportunity there um, currently too. Like I don't know where that is out here if you're not allowed to do it, but I know the midterm thing is like, it's the buzzword right now. I don't do any midterm, um, but I'm, I'm sure I will. At some point, I'll jump on any bandwagon. Next question. Barrett. What's up, guys? Barrett Bondo of Fly Real Estate, real estate broker, investor, and real estate app developer. Uh, anyway, 
interested in your how you got involved in REOs and how that helped you propel because kind of what I'm working on would make a lot of sense in that to catapult me forward. So I kind of want to hear your story on how you got involved in that. Uh, so obviously in 2008, REOs, so like when I looked at, okay, I'm, I don't want to do loans anymore. I want to do real estate. It was the only transactions that were happening were short sales or REO, right? So it was pretty simple in the sense that I knew I had to pick one because if I wanted to sell houses, that was 90% of the transactions. And just like this meetup, there's conferences, right? For every industry, there's a conference, right? Bigger Pockets Conference, who's hosting right here, by the way, there's your plug. Even though you don't want one, I'm gonna give you one. Um, there's REO conferences, Rio Mac, um, NRBA, which is the National REO Brokers Association, um, DS Pros, um, DS News, right? So default servicing. So there's a whole world in it. I had a friend that told me, I'm gonna go to the Rio Mac conference. It's in Palm Springs. I was like, oh shit, I guess I'll go. And I went and then I really good at drinking at the bar and talking. And before you knew it, I was sitting next to an asset manager and we're exchanging stories and laughing. And he's like, how long you been doing REO? And I was like, haven't done one yet. And he's like, well, here's my card. And he was like the vice president of Fannie Mae. So it's, it's a lot of luck. I mean, I, but it's luck by putting yourself in the room, right? And so, um, and then from there, it was fake it till you make it and got an assignment, didn't know what to do, didn't know what cash for keys was, you know, and then, became friends with the asset manager and the pre-marketer and the eviction coordinator. And it's like, and you fast forward, like well, however long ago that was, 13, 15 years, I'm still doing it to this day, but it's just a hedge fund. It's the same concept, like the same people I met at Fannie Mae now work at IH, right? Or work at Progress Residential, right? And it's the same concept, like the terminology, the, the, the way it works, you know, like I have analysts on my team that work with their analysts. like. It's, it's, it's a different universe than regular residential real estate, and you just have to reprogram your brain to know it. So I, first thing I would do is I'd say go to RealMac. That is a conference I would recommend. Um, or in Dallas, uh, I'd look up DS News. It's a publication. Um, and then from there, you start, you know, it's just like if you're in private capital, you should be, um, you know, part of the American Private Lenders Association or something like that. Okay, That's welcome. good. Tony? Yeah. Oh. Antonio, cousin, service first real estate. Also, in the, I'm going to broker on a service first real estate, also an investor. Honorary Sigma Nu? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, quick question. So, I'm heavy on the buy and hold strategy. Like, that's all I've been doing for the last six or so years. Um, you both seem to be big into flipping. So, from the tax perspective, I know you're getting killed in California. Ooh. So, I would like to know, like, what kind of strategies will you offer for those that want to get into flipping? Flipping, but are scared of the tax implications. There you go. Because you got a legal team for this, so tax team, I know that. So I don't know shit. <laughs> I just go to my CPA. No, but I actually do a lot of cost segregation on my multifamily and triplex, fourplexes. That kind of offsets my active income because you're right, as a flipper, you are really just producing income to pay your taxes. Um, and so if you can offset that with little long term holds and uh, just, you know, uh, doing any kind of tax depreciating strategies, then that's what you want to do. So I would say if you have those long-term holds, then you can take quite a bit of depreciation on that and use that towards your active income flipping homes. And then I would say since I don't own a lot of rentals, uh, you just pay your taxes. Like it's... <laughs> Yeah, honestly, Antonio, I just, it's just built into the equation. It is yeah. it, like I'm paying 40%. It is what it is. If I need X amount to survive, well, then I better make more. Um, and, you know, and, and obviously if I buy a house today, I may not be flipping it and closing it this year. So there's no income on that home just yet. It's all expense as well. So you'd be surprised. I don't pay the amount of taxes that you might think because as long as I'm forever flipping, Right? Like, actually, I paid more taxes the last year because I slowed down the purchasing. Yeah. And that's the first year I was like, oh, shit. I was like, this sucks. Because I was always buying, buying, buying. So, you know, if I made $3 million, I probably spent $5 million that year on the next 20 homes that we're working on. So I never really had to pay the hit that bad. Um, 
but yes, last year I did. And I mean, I've got a handful of rentals, so I get depreciation. Cost segregation is the greatest trick to lowering right your income. So that's definitely, I don't know if you're doing that with your buying holds, but you definitely should. Um, and just keep buying, just buy, buy, buy. But I'm not a believer of buying just for depreciation, just like everything must cash flow. That's my thought process on that. I know a lot of people that are like, I make too much money, I'm gonna buy it, even though it's not cash flowing because it's gonna offset this other deal that's cash flowing. I, I don't like that, I think that's a, a recipe for failure because what nobody realizes is that they could all not cash flow someday. Like, I find that like the younger people that I've mentored and stuff they, that didn't live through 2008, kind of are, are, they're Superman. Like they don't know what a loss feels like. They haven't got their butt kicked. So I think that's my guidance and that's my big brother to a lot of people is like, like I love that deal, be safe. I love that deal, but come on, man. You're like, uh, you squeeze a little much on that one. Let's, let's chill out a bit, you know? And then if you don't listen, you hit a home run, you just tell me, oh, you were wrong. Well, good, well, that's okay. You know, and if I saved you on one, then I'm, I don't need, I'm not here to say I told you so. I'm, I'm here to say, damn, I'm so happy I was there to support you, you know? So. Yep. All right. And for two more questions. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Harold Bailey, newbie, straight up newbie. Uh, I'm not into uh, Airbnbs or anything else, so this is really for all the investors in the room who are into it. Uh, I do a lot of community work, so I'm in the sphere of, uh, I guess, the politicians, I guess you could call it. So what would be a way, you say you were doing some work in, inside of uh, the political arena with the city council. So what will be a starting place for us as far as uh, any type of policies that could be put in place to help that our market out to give our, our council some direction? And for any investors, uh, I'm always looking to have coffee uh, and I'll pay. <laughs> Curveball on me there, I don't know. Wait, so your question is, uh, what advice could we give you to pass on to city council to make our life easier? <laughs> oh, shoot, allow us, to, oh, oh here, I got the easiest one. It's not even about more housing, or let us do the, the, the what do you, do you call it, dad do's? Dad do, the detach, no, none of that. All I ask and I beg is please look at our plans when we submit them, and like try to give us a permit maybe in 30 days. Like that would be, like, you know, you'd be turning water into wine for me if you could do that, because most cities, in my experience, it takes three to six months to get your plans and permits issued, and when you have debt on something, those carrying costs kill. Oh, yeah. And if a city could just figure out that we're on the same team, right, we're here to beautify that house or do something, we're not just capitalist scum, um, like, you know, have a system and a process for how do we push these plans through plan check and building in safety in a certain timeline. I don't understand how everyone else in the world has to have timelines, right, and repercussions. If I don't pay off that hard money loan in 12 months, I, I lose the house, right? But yet a city doesn't have a timeline to say, well, I need to look and review your plans within 10 days and give you an answer back, right? It could even be that I'm wrong and they need, like, like they, there, they need to be changes, but it could just sit there for three months and it's like, yeah, sorry, we didn't get to it. And I, and I think that's unfair. You know, developers and real estate investors, we are not the bad people that I think the media makes us up to be. We're really looking for change. Um, you know, we're, we're the ones that could stop homelessness in America if they actually looked at us and made us like a partner in the deal, right? So, oh man, you know, I need you two together, my city council members right there. <laughs> Make it work. That's we, really good. We got uh, well, we want we, we have a, a local person to add to that that's going back and forth with the STR government stuff right now. Dana. Yeah. Um, my name is Dana McCord. I'm the Louisiana broker or Vacasa. We do short-term rental property management in the city. I've been to almost every city council meeting, and I can't encourage you enough to get if you want to do short rentals, you need to be involved in Vacation Rental Management Association, VRMA. The hotel lobby was behind a lot of the restrictions that we're seeing right now. And us individually, this small group isn't enough to tackle the hotel lobby or what was the other, um, the affordable housing lobby. Uh, we just couldn't do it. And that's why all these restrictions just got recently passed. So you can join a group like VRMA. I strongly encourage you to do that because they do have a lobby that is kind of getting up there like 
National Association of Realtors. They're getting a strong lobby. So, And you can also be a part of Rent Responsibly, and they will get you in touch with local alliances. If you own short-term rentals in Louisiana or in other states, they will help you get in touch with those local alliances so there's strength in numbers. Emil, I think we're going to try to wrap up with the Q&A just to kind of keep on track here with the time. Okay. Um, but I did want to just let everybody know that Lega and Jesse will be down here up front for the rest of the night until we have this room until 10 p.m. So if there's any questions that didn't get answered or you just want to meet them, shake their hands, like, as you know, as you could tell through the interview, they're just so cool, so friendly, and like humble people, so come down and, and chat with them. Wait, hold on, hold on real quick. So you're going to make me stay here till 10 and no alcohol. But, but Emil gets to go downstairs right now. <laughs> I know, right? Take a Corona. Margarita, please. Salt in the rim. He'll bring it back. He'll bring it back. <laughs> um, but thank you guys seriously so much for being here and your time and information. Can we get it up for them? That was awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you.